This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. As a new Christian, one of the most immediate issues facing you is worship. Within a week of the time that you're baptized, the services of the Lord's Church are going to assemble, and you will have the opportunity to worship God. But you know, it might be that you're not exactly sure what to do. You're not exactly sure how God desires for you to worship Him. You need to understand that worship is a great privilege given to God's children, and it is certainly something that you want to engage in properly. Now, the Bible lists five acts of worship, preaching, prayer, singing, giving, and the Lord's Supper. In this lesson, we want to talk about the Lord's Supper, and there are three points that we want to cover. Number one, what is the Lord's Supper? Number two, the time and frequency of the Lord's Supper. And number three, we want to discuss some abuses and misunderstandings about the Lord's Supper. Now, first point, number one, what is the Lord's Supper? First, I want us to consider the fact that it is a memorial. In 1 Corinthians 11:23, the Bible says that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Now, the same thing is said about the fruit of the vine in verse 25. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, this do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. When Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, He took the unleavened bread, and He said that we are to eat it in remembrance of His body. He then took the fruit of the vine and said that we are to drink it in remembrance of His blood. Friends, it's really as simple as that. The Lord's Supper is a memorial. It's a time to reflect and a time to remember. There's nothing mysterious about it. There's nothing magical about it. I heard someone say on one occasion that partaking of the Lord's Supper forgave their sins. But partaking of the Lord's Supper does not forgive our sins. It is simply two emblems to help us remember. Like a person who might set out pictures of a loved one at a memorial or at a funeral. They do that so we can remember our loved one. A few years ago, I was in Washington, D.C., and I went to see the Vietnam Memorial. And there's a statue there of three soldiers. And next to it, there's a wall with the names of thousands of soldiers who died in that war. Now, here's a question. Why were those emblems set up? And the answer is to help us remember so that we don't forget. And the same thing is true about the Lord's Supper. Jesus Christ gave us emblems that represent His body and His blood, and they cause us to remember. Now, the next logical question is, what are we supposed to remember? Where should my thoughts be as I partake of the Lord's Supper? Well, the Bible says that I'm supposed to remember His death. I'm supposed to remember His body, and I'm supposed to remember His blood. 1 Corinthians 11:26 says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till He comes. Sometimes people will say that we're celebrating the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection. Well, certainly they're all tied together, and certainly they're hard to separate, but Jesus said that we do this in remembrance of His death. We are remembering the sacrifice. We are remembering the price that was paid. You know, there's an old spiritual song that asks, Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Well, of course I wasn't there, but the Bible here calls upon me to use my imagination and to let the Scriptures bring to my mind the things that happened there. And so, when I partake of the Lord's Supper, I visualize the abuse He suffered. When I partake of the bread, I see the body. I visualize the scourging that He endured. John 19 and verse 1 says, So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged Him. History says that when they would scourge an individual, they would use a short-handled whip. It had several thongs of various lengths. And in these thongs, there were tied small iron balls or sharp pieces of sheep's bones or perhaps iron chains with small weights at the end and the scourgers. There would oftentimes be two of them, and they would take turns, or there might be one who alternated positions, and they would beat the back of the individual until the blood began to trickle. 
and the bruises began to form. And it began to cut into the flesh and into the muscle. It has been said that it hurt so badly that some men have been known to have bitten their tongues in two during the beating. And when I remember the body of Christ, I think about that. I think about them putting the cross on his bloody, flesh-torn back. And I envision the nails being driven into his hands. In actuality, it was probably the base of the hands at the wrist. That would have been stronger. It could support the weight. And there's a bundle of nerves there that makes it excruciating. And the Romans were all about that. And then I envisioned the cross being stood up and dropped into the ground. Can you see the body? Can you appreciate the sacrifice? And then I partake of the fruit of the vine. And I imagine the blood. In my mind's eye, I see the crown of thorns being placed upon his head and the blood trickling down his face. I see his back bloodied from the beating. I see the Roman soldier piercing his side with the spear. And I always think about John 19, 34, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with the spear and immediately blood and water came out. I always visualize that in my mind. Someone told me that the Lord's Supper always means more to them immediately after they've heard a sermon on the crucifixion. And that makes sense because that's what we're remembering. And when you hear a sermon on what he endured, the emblems bring that to your mind. And the sacrifice that he made is more vivid. Jesus said, this do in remembrance of me. Now, why is that blood so precious? Because Matthew 26, 28 says, because it was shed for the remission of sins. Ephesians 1, 7 says, without that blood, there is no remission. A friend of mine said that during the Lord's Supper, he likes to remember by thinking of it this way. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now he said, what does he mean by that? Let me go through it for you. One, he thinks about the one Lord. Two thieves between whom he was crucified. Three crosses that stood on Calvary's hill. The four parts of his garment divided amongst the soldiers. The five wounds that he suffered. His head bloody from the crown of thorns. His back raw from the scourging his hands with the nail scars, his feet pierced with the spike, his side bleeding from the soldier's spear. Then six, he thinks about the six hours of darkness upon the earth at the point of his death. And then seven, he recalls the seven sayings that the Lord uttered upon the cross before he died. You know, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, it is a memorial. Now secondly, in answer to the question, what is the Lord's Supper? Not only is it a memorial, but it is also a proclamation. When we partake of these emblems, we proclaim to the world the death of our Lord. In 1 Corinthians 11:26, 26, the text says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Now, why is it important that we proclaim his death? Friends, because of what it means to us because it means that we have redemption of our sins and the hope of eternal life in heaven. Now, thirdly, in addition to being a memorial and in addition to being a proclamation, the Lord's Supper is also a communion. In Matthew 26, 29, when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, he told his disciples, but I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Now, what did the Lord mean when he said that? I think clearly it's a reference to the Lord's Supper. It's what we do each Lord's Day. And when we engage in that supper, Christ said that we are communing with him. 1 Corinthians 10, 16 calls it a communion of the body and the blood of the Lord. It says this, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Now, the word communion is from a Greek word that means a joint sharing, a joint participation. And sometimes it's translated as fellowship. And as I partake of the Lord's Supper, I fellowship with Christ in a very direct way. Jesus said that he would partake of it with us in the kingdom. And he does that every first day of the week. All right, point number two in our lesson. Let's discuss the time and the frequency of the Lord's Supper. You know, to many people in the religious world, the Lord's Supper is something that's done very infrequently. 
perhaps only at Christmas and Easter, and it's done on no particular set day of the week. A denomination near my house had a sign in front of their building that said that they were going to have a candlelight communion service on Thursday night. Another church said that they were doing it on Friday night. But you see, the problem with that is that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says that the early Christians met on the first day of the week to break bread or to partake of the Lord's Supper. Acts 20 and verse 7 says, Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, that is to partake of the Lord's Supper, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them. Now I want you to notice that they partook of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. And it's very interesting here. The Greek phrase for came together is in the passive voice indicating that their gathering or their assembly was not of their own initiative, but rather it was of divine appointment. In other words, this was God's idea that they come together on the first day of the week, not theirs. Brethren, the indication of the Bible is that we are to partake of the Lord's Supper on Sunday. It's the day that the Lord arose from the dead. It's the day that the church began. It's the day that the early Christians partook of it. We celebrate the resurrection of Christ every Sunday and that we come together to worship and we remember his death when we partake of the Lord's Supper. Now that we've established the day of the week that we're to partake of the Lord's Supper, the next question is how often should we partake of it? Now again, the religious world partakes once or maybe twice a year, but the Bible says this about the first century Christians. Acts 2.42 says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and prayers. Now one version says, And they were continually devoting themselves to the breaking of bread. Now, does it make sense to you to say that they were continuing steadfastly in the Lord's Supper if they were doing it once a year? Or somebody else says, Well, maybe twice. If that were the case, how do we know which two to choose? Now, I know which two people usually choose, but where does the Lord tell us which two? You know, if it were to be once a year, or if it were to be twice a year, I would expect that somewhere in the Bible, the Lord would have specified that. And if not, then He's been inconsistent because all the feasts that God ever ordained had a set time and a set frequency for their observance. Why would He change when instituting the Lord's Supper? And furthermore, if the Lord's Supper is to be observed once a year, I would expect the Bible somewhere to record a certain day of a certain month, just like he did the Feast of the Old Testament. But that's not what I find. And if it were to be observed once a month, then I would expect to find recorded a certain day of the month. But I don't find that either. And to carry out the reasoning here, I might also say this. If it were to be observed once a week, then I would expect to find recorded a certain day of the week. And you know what? That is exactly what I find on the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread. And other scriptures bear this out as well. Acts 20 and verse 7 and 1 Corinthians 11, 20 and verse 33 indicate that the early church came together to break bread. And 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2 tell us that the day that they came together was the first day of the week. And in fact, in the original Greek, it contains the word kata, which literally means every, literally every one of the week, or on the first day of every week. And many versions translate it that way. Friends, the scriptures teach, and the New Testament bears out, that the early Christians partook of the Lord's Supper every first day of every week. Now, sometimes people will say, well, that's too often. If we partake of it that often, then, then it becomes commonplace and it loses its significance. You know, maybe if the individual lets his mind wander, it may lose its significance. But that's true with regard to any act of worship. And honestly, who can tell me that once a week is too often to remember the Lord's sacrifice on the cross? Can you truly tell me that if I think about the sacrifice that saves my eternal soul once a week, that it will lose its significance? You know, there are 10,080 minutes in a week, five of them spent in memorial of the Lord's death, cannot trivialize what was done on Calvary. Okay, point number three. Let's discuss some abuses and misunderstandings of the Lord's Supper. 
First, there is the misunderstanding that the elements of the Lord's Supper literally become flesh and literally become the blood of Jesus Christ. The Roman Catholic Church believes in this doctrine and they call it transubstantiation. And they believe that when they partake of the communion, that Christ is literally present and that He is offering Himself to God. They consider the Lord's Supper as a re-sacrificing of Jesus Christ. But that idea is totally foreign to the Scriptures. The Bible nowhere teaches such a concept. If the bread and the fruit of the vine literally became the body and blood of Jesus Christ, the word for that would be cannibalism, not transubstantiation. You know, the fact of the matter is, the Lord's Supper is not a re-sacrifice. Hebrews 9.28 says that Christ was offered once. And the word once literally means once and for all, once and only once. Now, a second misconception about the Lord's Supper is that we partake of it in order to have our sins forgiven. Now, again, the Roman Catholic Church believes that the Lord's Supper, which they call the Holy Eucharist, is a sacrifice, or I should say a re-sacrifice, and they believe that it is propitiatory. In other words, it pays the price for sins. And so they believe that when you partake of it, that God pardons wrongdoings and sins, and they would say even grave ones. And so the whole thing would be kind of mystical and almost a magical ceremony. They believe Christ is actually present, He is re-sacrificed, and you are forgiven of your sins. But friends, again, the Bible doesn't teach that. When I became a Christian and I was baptized for the remission of my sins, that's where I contacted the blood of the Savior, Romans 6, 3 and 4. And now that I am a Christian, I continue to have my sins forgiven by repentance, confession, and prayer, and walking in the light, according to 1 John 1, 7 through 9. It's not by partaking of the Lord's Supper. Now, a third misconception or abuse is to partake of the Lord's Supper, but to do so not discerning the Lord's body. Now, to not discern the Lord's body means to partake of the emblems, the bread and the fruit of the vine, without focusing on what they represent, not remembering the body and the blood of the Lord. And this is the problem they had in the city of Corinth in the first century. They had made the Lord's Supper into a common meal, and in so doing, they had missed the meaning of it. They were eating it for food's sake, and Paul severely scolds them. In 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 20, he said, Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Now, it should have been, but not the way they were doing it. Verse 21, For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry, and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? And verse 27 tells us that they were partaking of the Lord's Supper unworthily. Now, what does that mean? It means they were treating it flippantly. They were not discerning the Lord's body. They were ignoring the significance of it. They were not remembering. And Paul says that he that partakes in this manner eats and drinks judgment to himself. Now, the King James says, damnation to himself, verse 29. And particularly, I want you to notice the word unworthily. It's not unworthy. And there's a big difference in these two because none of us are worthy of the blood of the Lord. If he were saying that, then none of us could ever partake of the Lord's Supper. You know, occasionally a misguided Christian will not partake of the Lord's Supper one Sunday, and he will say, well, I'm not worthy this week. Friend, you will never be worthy. I will never be worthy. But the word here is unworthily. The people in Corinth were eating the Lord's Supper unworthily. That is, they had made it a common meal. And that's why Paul says in verse 20, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Now, it should have been, but it wasn't the way they were doing it. Now, why not? Because they were not discerning the Lord's body. It wasn't a memorial of the body and blood of the Lord. It was just food. And then on top of that, they were slighting their less fortunate brethren when they ate the meal. They didn't discern the Lord's body by remembering what the emblems meant. And we might also say that they didn't discern the Lord's body, which is the church, because they disregarded their brethren. When they partook of the Lord's Supper, their minds were not where they should have been. And you know the same thing could be said about me today. Maybe my mind is wandering, and instead of focusing on what I'm doing, I'm thinking about something else. Maybe I'm not reflecting. 
maybe I'm not remembering. And so he tells us in 1 Corinthians 11:28, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. That means I need to check myself. I need to make sure I'm doing this the right way and make sure that I'm not doing it unworthily. That is, in a thoughtless manner. What is the Lord's Supper? It's a memorial. It's a proclamation, and it's a communion. When should we partake of it? Each and every first day of the week. And how should we do it? Thoughtfully, considering the body and the blood of Christ and that precious death that saved me from my sin.